Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday to you. Welcome to our Sunday morning service here at Ellerslie Road Baptist Church. Welcome also to those who are joining us online today. And I trust that the last song that uh, Gail and Wendy just played, Oh, How I Love Jesus, will be something that resonates in our hearts today as we express our praise and worship to our God. I want to begin with our call to worship today from Psalm 71, where the psalmist says, In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have leaned from my birth. It was you who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. The psalmist said, be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress. I want to invite you to stand as we join in singing this first hymn this morning. The Lord's our rock, in him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. <clears throat> together. The Lord's my rock, in Him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. A shade by day, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm. No fears alarm, no foes affright, a shelter in the time of storm. Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. The raging storms around us beat, a shelter in the time of storm. shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time Amen. Let's pray together. Dear God in heaven, thank you for sending your son Jesus into this world that through him we might be saved. We praise you, Lord, that you are our rock of refuge and strong fortress, our shade by day, defense by night, that in you we find our protection from the storms of this life. 
Help us to look to you and to lean upon you, knowing that you are ever with us. In these moments today, that we are gathered here as your people to worship, incline your ear to our songs of praise, our prayer of adoration and thanksgiving. Be thou our vision, O Lord of our hearts. Amen. Choose to 
faithful and just, and you will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We thank you, kind Father, for your gift of grace. In fact, you have blessed us beyond what we deserve. All we have and all that we are able to do are part of your good gifts to us. Thank you for the warmth of summertime and the gift of rest during these special months. Thank you for your children, for their energy and curiosity, and especially for those who responded to the gospel message during our day camp. Thank you for the generosity of our church family and those who share their time, talents, and treasure with your church. We are sincere, Heavenly Father, in our desire to be a people who are holy set apart for you. Would you bless us with divine wisdom and insight as we finish out this summer season? We ask for direction for, your, for our church staff as we plan for our fall season. And we ask you to motivate the church family to step forward and join us as we seek to bring Jesus into life here in Southwest Edmonton. We also ask for financial provision for the church family and the church and we are blessed that you will provide all our needs according to your riches in glory. We ask for your comfort on those who are hurting this morning, especially the family of Alan and Marlene Strom as they mourn the sudden loss of their daughter. Thank you for your comfort during this difficult time. And we ask your blessing upon our mission partners wherever they are serving worldwide. We especially ask for your blessing upon Scott and Nancy Campbell, who serve in Quebec. We pray for their church and the food bank that is such a key component of their outreach ministry. May their work result in many coming to know the Lord Jesus. Also, we join Scott and Nancy in their prayer for more workers and missionaries in Quebec, church workers who would serve the Quebec church in counseling, group life, and children's ministries. And finally, Heavenly Father, we ask for your blessing upon Pastor Joel as he shares the message you have placed on his heart. May his words be pleasing to you and helpful to our church family, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
many of you know, our elementary children are part of the first part of our service over the summer. And we like to do a moment just to highlight for kids, and I think the adults enjoy it too, a uh, kid-friendly element in our service. And today, to help me out, I have a special guest. And I want you to introduce your, yourself. What is your name? Mandel. Mandel. And Mandel, how old are you? Six. Six. Mandel, what has been your favorite part of your summer so far? Oh, you went to camp with your sister. How fun. Awesome. Well, oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Mandel. And Mandel, I have a little science experiment I'm going to do with you, okay? So here I have a glass of water and a piece of paper. Oh, my, did my paper fall out? Maybe my paper fell out. Did my paper fall out? Oh, no. Oh, thanks. Pastor Joel's going to help me out. <laughs> thanks, Pastor Joel. Appreciate that. That's just my backup paper. <laughs> All right, Mandel, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to tip this glass of water over your head and then let go. But you're not going to get wet. Do you trust me? You, th you sure you trust me? I don't know. Okay, ready? Here we go. Let's give this a try. I'm going to tip it over top. Over top. Whoa! Did you get wet? Oh! Let's give our helper a round of applause. You know, Mandel, Pastor Joel's going to come up here in a little bit, and he's going to talk about the story of Joseph. And in the story of Joseph, you know, he didn't really know what God was doing all the time. God's plan didn't quite make sense. Like me saying, I'm going to tip water over your head, but you're not going to get wet. But you know what? Joseph just had to trust God at his word, and you were able to trust me because you know me. In the same way, jo Joseph knew God so he could trust God. And jo again, Pastor Joel's gonna talk more about that in a little bit, but thanks again for listening. Another round of applause for our lovely helper.
Good morning, and welcome to Ellerslie Road Baptist Church. If we haven't met before, my name is Nathan, and I'm a part of the worship arts ministry team here at the church. And as the technical director, I have a passion to see production draw people towards Jesus and team members have a blast while serving. I love to help people get connected and involved right here at Ellerslie. For any kids here in the auditorium, you are dismissed to head off to Kids Church. You can find one of our team members from the eKids team with vests on this side of the auditorium. We hope you guys have an absolute blast upstairs. For those of you staying with us for the remainder of the service, whether online or in person, we want to make sure you feel connected and at home here at Ellerslie. There are two ways you can help us do that. First, if you're new, just text NEW to 587-912-0002 or show the camera on your phone this QR code that's on screen now. And this will give us a chance to interact with you and make sure we don't miss welcoming you into our community. Secondly, if you have been here for a while and would like to get in touch with a team member, uh, serve with the team, or get baptized, or simply ask us any question, why don't you text CONNECT to the same number or scan the QR code that's on screen now, and we'll be sure to get back to you. As we begin heading into the fall, there are so many great ways that you can get involved here at Ellerslie. One of our major events in the fall that we want everyone to know about is Training Day. Training Day is where people from across all our ministry departments come together for a day of teaching, vision casting, and development in their area of service. For more details and to register for this day, why don't you head on over to erbc.ca slash training to start the process of being involved in this great event. Training day will be on Saturday, September 17th. So if you currently do serve or plan to start serving, why don't you join us that day? And we'll see you on Saturday, September 17th. Another exciting project that we will be uh, participating in over October and November is the renovation and redesign of our building's foyer. We can't wait for you to see what our design team has been working on this fall. But in the meantime, we're looking for people to uh, be compiled in the list of names who might be interested in serving in this way. Whether you have skills that might be similar to a carpenter or a plumber or an electrician or a drywaller, whether you can lay carpet or you just want to help, why don't you text 587-912-0002 or email Joel Jacobs at jjacobs at erbc.ca and let us know how you can help. Regardless of how much time you can give, we're looking for you. So why not get involved and leave your mark here at Ellerslie? As believers, we understand that everything we have ultimately belongs to God, and we give back with what we have to the church to help with the work and the ministry that happens here at Ellerslie. Your giving pays for staffing, our facility, utilities, and everything else it takes to put on programs right here in Southwest Edmonton. It also supports our global missions partners, bringing Jesus to life all over the world. You can give through one of our giving kiosks in the foyer, the drop boxes in the auditorium, or simply online at erbc.ca slash give. Now, grab your Bible, your journal, and a pen or pencil as we dive into this week's message from our series, Summer Blockbuster. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to be back with you this morning. I have been away for a little while on vacation with my family. And one of the things that Michelle and I discovered as we were on vacation is you can go on vacation, but you're still a parent there, and nothing changes if you bring your kids with you. There's still, still just as much work to bring your kids on vacation. It's just like doing life in a different place. So anyway, but we had a great time, and we got to do some fun things with our kids. And uh, hey, uh, that story that Kelsey told earlier, uh, I, I told her, I said, hey, you know what would be really fun is if you did that story with an adult under that glass of water and, and see how that <laughs> goes over. I was nervous. I don't know about you guys. I, I knew it was going to happen there, but I was still, even that, I was nervous for that little guy. <laughs> anyway, hey, here's a picture uh, coming up now of Disney's Malaboomer, it's called. It was a ride at Disneyland. It kind of wrapped up its time in Disney in 2010, but about 15 years ago... 
I had uh, the ability to ride this thing on a trip to Disneyland. And I was in my 20s at the time, and I wanted to be, you know, a man and, and not afraid of anything. So I said I was going to ride this gross ride. Uh, and I don't like free fall rides. So for me, this was like a significant, you know, endeavor that I was going to do this. And so what this ride does is it launches you up in the air. Most rides just free fall down. This one launches you up in the air. And as you kind of get to the top, it loses momentum. And then it free falls back to the earth until, you know, it's supposed to catch you before you hit the ground. And, you know, you would hope Disney's safety record would, would say that you're going to be fine. But it doesn't matter when you're Joel standing in front of that ride. You're worried about everything. And so I decide, yeah, I'm going to go on this thing. But in order to kind of make it a little easier for me and, and sort of break some of the suspense and the tension that would always build up in my stomach, I would, I would scream as the ride began and pretty much for the duration of this ride because then, you know, it wouldn't be so bad. And if you've ever been on a roller coaster, you know what I'm talking about. As they drop down, if you're like, wah, whatever, it's not quite as bad and it doesn't tickle your tummy as much. So they strap me into this thing. And when, let, me, let me say this. When you're standing at the bottom of that ride, looking up, on the side of it, it says 400, 500, 600, all the way up to 1,000. And when you're standing up there, you'd swear that that ride was 1,000 feet tall, and that's what those numbers meant. But I think it's just part of the decoration, because in reality, the ride's only 180 feet tall. But that's really tall to fall from. Okay, take it from me. I know what I'm talking about here. So anyway, they strap me into this this uh, ride and my feet are dangling. You don't, you don't have your feet in anything, so you just sit there and your feet are dangling. And it lifts you like five or 10 feet off the ground while it pressurizes these air tanks up. And they're meant to launch you up to the top of this ride. And then it counts down. And because it's Disney, it's a suspenseful thing. When it gets to one, the ride doesn't go anywhere. You just sit there and it slowly just bobs. And you're like, well, when is this going to happen? So I'm readying myself so that I can let out my scream so that I can withstand this ride. And out of nowhere, this thing <laughs> launches me and everyone else on it up 180 feet in the air. And before I even realize it, I'm at the top of this thing and I haven't screamed yet. And it's not because I forgot. It's because my stomach and my voice are still 180 feet below me on the ground. And my feet are dangling now as this thing starts to lose speed and I regain some sort of, you know, mental capacity. And I look down and I'm like, we got to go back down there now. <laughs> and so I try to let out a scream, but nothing comes out. It's the first time in my life that I've been speechless. Just ask Michelle. There's never been a moment in my life where I've been that out of control. And I try to scream and all that comes out is... <laughs> That's it. That's all that I have. And so I have to ride this silly thing without being able to dissipate all this nervous energy. And so we fall down and bounce up and fall back down. And I survived the ride because I'm here today. But my point in telling you this story is I, like, I don't like being out of control. And I don't think that we like being out of control. And in that moment, I was so out of control. I couldn't even control my own voice. And that was a weird experience for me. I couldn't even scream. I just had to go along for the ride. And I tell you that story because I think life can sometimes be like that for us. Like, we don't even know what to do with ourselves. We're just along for the ride sometimes. And today we're going to be continuing our summer blockbuster series. And last week, Pastor Dave, he was talking to us and he shared with us the story of Joseph and uh, he talked about how God is hidden but not absent. And we learned several of the details of the story of Joseph last week in, in Genesis 37 about how Jacob had his favorite son, and that was Joseph. And Joseph was given this special coat that his dad gave him, was meant to designate that he was a, a special guy in the family and he was his father's favorite. And Joseph had a couple of prophetic dreams. And these dreams were from the Lord, and they were to show him what his future was going to look like. You see, Joseph was going to be this amazing person in his family. He was going to rise to the top, and one day his brothers and his father and mother would bow down to him. Now, understandably, this bothered his brothers because they were older than him for the most part. And in that culture, like it went in order of oldest to youngest. And Joseph was one of the younger ones. So how dare you say that we're going to bow down to you one day, Joseph? And so they get kind of ticked about this, and they hatch a plan to kill this guy. 
But in the final version of what ends up happening, they throw him into a cistern where eventually they take him out and they give him or sell him to the Ishmaelites as they're this group of people traveling to Egypt where they're going to sell Joseph as a slave. And they take Joseph's coat from him and they cover it with animal blood and they use that to convince their father that Joseph has been killed by a wild animal. Now, we have four kids in our house, and at times I think that our lives are crazy, and our home is dysfunctional, and there could be no more family that's crazier than ours until I read the story of Joseph, and then I'm like, wow, we're doing pretty good. So far, none of our kids have been sold into slavery, so there's still time, they're young, right? Anyway, uh, things at this point look like they couldn't be worse for Joseph. And so today, we're actually going to continue the story. I love the story of Joseph. We're going to continue the story, and we're going to uh, continue on in chapter 39, actually. And this is where Joseph ha- uh, has arrived in Egypt with the Ishmaelites, and he's about to be sold into slavery. And we're going to do a fairly high view, sort of a 30,000-foot a view of the details of chapter 39, because there's a lot to get through here. Um, because I don't want to miss uh, the conclusion of this story, and so we're just going to go over the last few chapters really quickly, but 39 will camp on for a while. And uh, one of the things that we're going to do as we go through this is we're not going to miss the main point of what the author of Genesis is trying to teach us in this story, because the story of Joseph tells us something very foundational about our faith. It's an important doctrine even as Christians that we believe, and that is that God is sovereign, And we don't want to miss that. And when we say that God is sovereign, here's what we mean. We mean that he is in control all of the time over everything, working it to accomplish his purpose here. As R.C. Sproul says, there isn't one particle, one molecule floating around in the universe that is outside of God's sovereign control, and he isn't aware of it and cannot influence as he chooses. Uh, He calls it the maverick molecule. And what he means is, is there isn't one, uh, if God wasn't sovereign, we couldn't guarantee that that one molecule that was outside of his control wouldn't be the grain of sand in the machinery of God's grand plan that wouldn't mess the whole thing up. The Bible declares in Psalm 93.1, the Lord reigns. And in Romans 11.36, it says, For from him and through him and for him are all things. According to Steve Lawson from the Pillars of Grace, the sovereignty of God is the free exercise of his supreme authority in executing and administrating his eternal purposes. God must be sovereign if he is truly God. A God who is not sovereign is not God at all. Now, as Christians, if I was to ask you, do you believe in God's sovereignty? Do you believe that God is in control all of the time over everything? You would be like, yeah, of course he is. But I think in practice, and when the emotion of life comes around, um, that this doctrine can actually be one of the things that's hard for us to grasp and hold on to. Life sometimes doesn't demonstrate the control that we think God ought to have over his creation. And because he doesn't think or he doesn't do what we think he should do in a certain situation, we have a tendency in those moments to think that God isn't sovereign. Maybe he isn't in control. You know, how could a sovereign God allow that to happen in the world? How could a sovereign God or why wouldn't a sovereign God rescue me or rescue them from that situation? But when we question God's sovereignty... It doesn't change God's sovereignty. It just means that we don't understand the mind of God. And when we think like that, and when we have these moments, it can lead us to two conclusions. One, we can become bitter. We can be angry at God and be jaded. And the doctrine of the sovereignty of God can be one of these breaking points that can break our faith. Or we can choose to claim that he is God. And even when we don't understand, we can trust that he is working everything that is going on in the world and everything that is going on in our lives exactly as he wants it to be. Uh, I was a, a contractor and I worked in construction for many years. And one of the things that we would do is we would lay tile. 
And when you would mix mortar, sometimes that mortar, if it hadn't been sifted properly, would get a little pebble in it. And if you spread mortar, a good tile setter will spread the mortar on the ground, and he'll also spread it on the back of the tile, and then he'll bed that tile into that mortar, and it will firm up. And when it firms up, that tile's not going anywhere. But if there's a pebble in that mortar, when you set it on the ground, and then you put that tile right on top of that, that pebble becomes a point that sits right underneath the bottom of that tile. And what can happen is, if you put that on concrete, it's not a big deal, because concrete's not going to move. But if that tile is set on a wood floor and there's any movement at all in that wood floor and there's a little pebble underneath it, that pebble now becomes the breaking point for that tile. And when you step on it, that pebble's not going to move. But if that tile moves, that tile breaks just like that. It'll crack. We don't want the sovereignty of God to be the pebble that causes us to break when there's pressure on us. We want the sovereignty of God to be the mortar that keeps us firmly in place when things aren't going well. This is why the story of Joseph is so great, because it displays God's sovereignty to us in a life that wasn't that easy to live. And as a matter of fact, it was a very dramatic life. It had incredible highs and incredible lows. And so we're going to look at that this morning. So we're going to pick it up here in chapter 39, verse 1. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian, was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites, who had taken him there. So in what you can imagine was an incredibly traumatic event as his brothers have sold Joseph into slavery. Joseph is now in Egypt. He has arrived. And I can't help Uh, But think of this situation. The Bible doesn't talk a lot about the emotion of it, but can you imagine if somebody in your family sold you into slavery against your will and you were sent to a foreign land and you didn't know what was going to happen to you or what it was going to look like, but all you knew is your life was going to be changed forever. And you can think of the emotion that he must have been feeling as his brothers handed him over to this group of people that are heading to a foreign land, how he probably, I don't know if he was bound or not bound, but when he had, when they handed him over, how he was probably crying. This is like a 16 or a 17 year old kid, probably pleading with his brothers and grasping at their clothes. Don't do this. Don't sell me as he sat there and watched as they didn't relent. And they took a few pieces of silver for his life, demonstrating how hard their hearts and callous their hearts were towards him. And yet they did nothing. They just let it happen. And now as the story picks up, the caravan has entered Egypt and they've headed to the market. And now they're selling Joseph just like any other commodity, like a couch or a jar of oil. Here is Joseph being sold. And that's what a slave was worth back then. You know, they they didn't have a lot of value. And you can consider that Joseph probably even um, conjured up some resentment on the part of Potiphar, this guy who bought him, uh, towards Potiphar, I should say, because Potiphar has now purchased him and has now changed his life forever. The life that Joseph had and the, the, the freedom that he enjoyed and the love that, that he was shown by his father, that is all gone. And he is alone. And this man is now going to be controlling his future. And as we consider what Joseph was going through on a personal level, you have to wonder in those moments if he was questioning where God was in all of that. If God is real and I'm going to be this great person in my family and I had these dreams, how is God going to redeem this and how is he going to do this now that I'm a slave in a foreign land? How easy in that moment would it have been for Joseph to believe that God isn't real? And I'm sure he had these feelings and he was overcome with these feelings of hopelessness and despair. And like I said, he had those dreams But when you're in the valleys of life, you forget about the promises of God. It becomes really easy to forget. Like those dreams for Joseph in that moment were probably like, he probably could have chalked that up to like, I just had bad pizza the night before and I had these weird dreams and I thought God was doing something, but he's not. He can't possibly be. And at this point, it may have seemed that there was no way that God was going to be able to redeem the life that Joseph thought he was going to have. But in the midst of his despair, as we read this story, the author makes it clear that while Joseph may appear to be alone, God is working right beside him. And we get the sense as the reader that maybe 
there's going to be some comfort for Joseph down the road, and maybe there's a bigger plan at play for him by God. Let's continue reading. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. And when his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything that he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and he became his attend or pardon me, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. It's clear to his master that there's something different about Joseph. And it isn't just his abilities or his, his natural talents here, although Joseph might have had some great abilities. But that's not what Potiphar sees here. Potiphar sees that there's something divinely special about this kid, that God must be with him. Uh, there's no indication that Potiphar believes in God, but Potiphar believes that there is something divine happening in Joseph's life. And so Potiphar takes and he elevates Joseph's status in the home and gives him a different position. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entered to his care everything that he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. Pardon me, with Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except for the food that he ate. Potiphar isn't confused about what's going on here. He understands that there's something special about this guy and everything that Joseph touches starts to turn to gold. And so Potiphar's like, why not give him everything? I mean, his kids are behaving better. The animals are producing more. The stock or the, the grass in the, the fields is growing better. My wrinkles are going away. Like everything that Joseph is near starts to make, you know, things better in Potiphar's life. And so Potiphar's like, have it all, Joe. You know, let's, let's go. And so Potiphar's becoming wealthy because God is in the picture. We are beginning to see here that despite the incredible setbacks that have happened in Joseph's life to this point, God's plan hasn't been hindered in any way by this stuff. As a matter of fact, despite what would seem like a cursed life, probably from Joseph's perspective, it's clear God is doing some cool stuff and he's there working things out in the background. God is clearly present in his life to everyone else around Joseph. I think we also need to take note here as we get to this point in the story of, of, of Joseph's attitude. Oh, I bumped the button a little soon. Anyway, we'll get there. Anyway, I think we need to take note of Joseph's attitude in this whole situation. There's no indication that Joseph is complaining about his situation, which is probably not the way I would do it. If I was sold into slavery, I think my life would be over. I don't know if I would ever recover. And I know it sounds like I'm joking, but I'm serious. If I knew my, like, I, I, went, I went to school in Regina away from my uh, soon-to-be wife for four months. And my world was over because I wasn't with the love of my life anymore. So I can't imagine the condition I would be in if I was sold into slavery and everything and everyone I knew was left behind. But there's no indication that Joseph is complaining or even wondering what's going on. Where are you in all of this, God? I'm sure he had those feelings, but the Bible doesn't tell us that he wavered at all or wondered about God's sovereignty or his ability to rescue him or restore him to his previous way of life. And that's a good thing that he didn't have that because God has no intentions of restoring Joseph to his former way of life. As a matter of fact, God has much, much bigger plans than I bet you Joseph could have ever imagined. There are so many times throughout the story of Joseph where the situation he finds him in could have broken his faith in God. And who could blame him? But he doesn't break the sovereignty of God presides over the story of Joseph. And for us, it's easy to look back at this story and see that playing out. But because, you know, as we look at the story, you know, we're so convinced that God's got this in his control from our vantage point that we don't even think about the emotion that Joseph is going through. We don't think that 13 years went by as a slave and in prison and all this. Joseph would have had to deal with all of that. We don't even think about that because we read it from a different view. We read the story with a settled spirit because we understand that the ends must justify the means. But when we don't have this story view, when we're the character in the story, 
Is our steadfastness in the sovereignty of God really that secure? If we don't understand the sovereignty of God when we suffer, it means that we're suffering for nothing or that we're suffering alone, or somehow maybe God has overlooked us. Our prayers, like have you ever had a moment like that when your prayers just feel like they're bouncing off the ceiling, like God is not around? You're praying over and over again, where are you, God? Why are you not here? Why can't I see you? The truth is, life is full of mountaintops and valley experiences. And we just don't have the same perspective on life and on God's sovereignty in the valleys of life. It's hard for us to see that, see that he's got a plan, see that things are working out. But even when God doesn't appear to be around us, it doesn't change God's eternal qualities. Even when we're in the valleys and we're like, where are you, God? I don't see you. You're not here. You're not answering me. It doesn't change the fact that God is still sovereign and he's still sitting on his throne and he's in control of everything. In those moments in life, we need to stand firm and we need to claim the truth that we know about God. Maybe not the way we feel about him, but what we know about him. And we need to say, I understand, God, that you are in control and you are sovereign. Even when I don't see it, even when I don't understand it, you are sovereign. Our lives, regardless of what they look like and what they feel like, are in God's hands. No matter how deep the valley is, we cannot escape. We cannot find our way out of the sovereign control of our God. That's really cool. Carrying on here in 6b. Now, Joseph was well-built and handsome. Now, that's quite the statement. Uh, when you see details like this in the Bible, it, uh, it, it can bring up some different thoughts. Now, I think two things when I see this. First of all, the Bible isn't some saucy romance novel. It's a love story, but it's not some saucy romance novel. So when you see details like well-built and handsome, you know something crazy is about to probably happen here. And the second thing that I think when I see that Joseph is well-built and handsome is like, really, God? You know, like, you've given this guy, like, incredible blessings. Everything he touches turns to gold. And on top of that, he gets to be well-built and handsome. Is that really that fair? Coming from a guy who has neither of these qualities, if I made the rules, I think I would do it a little differently. If you were good-looking, you would be useless. You would get no other blessings. And if you were uh, successful and wealthy, you needed to be ugly. So in my economy, (laughs) Jeff Bezos should be the ugliest guy on earth, right? You're thankful now that I'm not the guy writing history, right? Anyway, nevertheless, because of the blessings that followed this guy around, you can start to see, I mean, he's well-built, he's handsome, the blessings of the Lord are upon him. You start to get an idea of why his brother's may have had an issue with him. I mean, Joseph is the neighbor that you have next door that always seems to have it together. They're never yelling at their kids. Their kids never yell in the yard. They're perfect family. You know, they work out. They're not overweight. They don't struggle with anything. They drive a nicer car than you. Like, you're fine if that neighbor moves to Siberia, right? That's Joseph to his brothers. Some of you are looking at me and you're like, I don't have a neighbor like that. You're the neighbor then! Anyway, you can sort of understand how his brothers would have had an issue with some of that. Anyway, but because of God's sovereignty and his rule over this whole thing, even Joseph's good looks play a part in this story. God uses it all. It's a part of his divine plan. The very development of Joseph's body is something that he uses to bring about his ends. In verse 7, we see that Joseph's good looks and his success start to garner the attention of Potiphar's wife, and not in a good and healthy way either. His good looks and his success have aroused this woman's curiosity in him, and she begins to proposition herself to this young man day after day. But Joseph stands firm. Joseph has an idea of what God's doing in his life. He might not know the end, and it might be confusing, but Joseph knows that God's in it, and so he refuses. Joseph's a good man, and he fears God, and he respects his master, and he says, with me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern me with any 
uh, concern himself with anything in a house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Notice how Joseph has this perspective about God still being in his life, despite the fact that he's a slave, despite the fact that he's not rising to the top of his family at the moment, he still fears the Lord. And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Now, there is a lesson here about temptation, and we're not going to talk about that, but Joseph flees from her. He doesn't go anywhere near her because he realizes that she is dangerous. Joseph's response is amazing to us, and it's far beyond his years, the wisdom that he displays. Despite everything that he has gone through, Joseph remains faithful to God. And how is this even possible to do this unless you have this view of God's sovereignty and that you are in his hands. The circumstances um, that he has gone through have been horrible and the things that have happened in his life have been hard to explain, but even those things, even those things have not caused Joseph to waver in his faith in God. How easily it would have been for him in those moments to be angry with God. And then in his anger, take advantage of that. I mean, think about uh, Potiphar. This is a perfect opportunity if you resent your master to get back at him, to take advantage of the situation, to stab in his, in, in his back, essentially, by taking advantage of his wife. Or how easy would it have been for Joseph in those moments to think, God doesn't care if I sin or not. Look at what my brothers got away with. Look at what happened to my life. But Joseph doesn't do that. In the midst of all this temptation and the things that are going around, Joseph, Joseph stays strong. The things in life that should have been sufficient enough to break him and make him resent God are not enough to break Joseph. For Joseph, life is confusing and he doesn't understand it. But God, in those moments, is still seated on his throne and he's still sovereign over everything that's going on. And it helps Joseph to make some pretty important and wise decisions in his life. One day, he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. We got problems now. She caught him by the cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hands, and he ran out of the house. Joseph continues to treat this woman with respect and dignity, and, and doesn't waver in his faith, but things at this point have reached a new level as she begins to become physically aggressive with him. But he still doesn't break, even in all of that, and he runs out of the house, leaving his clothes behind. This guy runs out of the house, and it's not a good scene. He's either running out of the house in his best-case scenario, wearing his Spider-Man underwear. In his worst-case scenario, he's wearing his birthday suit. Either way, this is not a good way to leave a house, right? Right? And it's not a good scenario which is playing out for Joseph right now. Because after this latest rejection, Potiphar's wife is a little ticked. She starts to get mad at Joseph. I think there's a saying out there that says, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Well, that is true for Joseph. Because Potiphar's wife now is going to make up a story and she's going to use that cloak that he left behind. Which is completely untrue of him. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has, has been brought to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. And when he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and he ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told this story. That Hebrew slave you, you brought us came to make sport of me. I mean, she's, not taking, she's not taking credit for anything here. She's even saying to her husband, look, it's kind of your fault. You bought this guy and you brought him here. Like, this is actually more your fault than mine, which is another fabrication. This is all her fault. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and he ran out of the house. And you could be looking at this story and at this point, you could be thinking the moral of the story is stop leaving your clothes around, Joseph. Joseph. Every time somebody else gets the, this guy's clothes in his hands, they're fabricating some lie about him. Teenagers, if you're listening, pick the clothes off the floor in your rooms. You never know what's going to happen. <laughs> the cloak is used again as evidence against Joseph to fabricate a lie about his life. 
When his master heard this story that his wife had told him saying, this is how your slave treated me, he burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. Now, at the moment, on the surface, it seems like Potiphar's wife may have won this, that she's dealt another blow to Joseph's life and the lie is gonna work. But the author shows us in the next verse that this is actually still a part of God's plan. God is still in control. He's reigning over the situation. And even the evil that Potiphar's wife has meant to put onto Joseph is not enough to stop to God's plan from, ta- from taking, or from God from taking that situation and making it accomplish his divine purpose. You see, uh, God isn't messed up for a minute or even slowed down by our sin. He can take it and he just keeps on using it and keeps on moving forward. The good new- this is good news for us. Because if God could be stopped by our sin and he could be slowed down by our sin, then that would mean that our faith could be in jeopardy. That would mean that maybe God's plan of salvation for the world could have been messed up if everything hadn't perfectly happened the way it is. But God is sovereign even over our sinful actions. Joseph is put in prison here, but his master could have killed him for what he had did. Remember, he's a commodity. He's like your dishwasher to these people. If it breaks down, you just throw it out and get a new one. If your slave is caught in adultery or even attempted uh, rape, of course that you could take their life. But Potiphar doesn't do that. Potiphar takes him and puts him in prison. And there's a sense here because he doesn't kill Joseph that he maybe isn't fully buying his wife's story either. It says in here that he burned with anger, but it doesn't say who he was angry at. There's a chance that Potiphar was actually ticked at his wife because Joseph was this golden boy in the house that turned everything into an amazing reality for them. And now she's fabricated this story about it and he's maybe angry that he has to get rid of the servant in order to save face in the family and in the community. And so Potiphar puts him in prison, but not just any prison. This is the prison of the captain of the guard. That is where the king's officials go when they do bad stuff. And so Joseph is going to now rub shoulders with some people that are in Pharaoh's court. And that is going to lead to the next step in progressing God's plan. The other thing that's really interesting here is that the captain of the guard is Potiphar. So Potiphar has put Joseph in his prison, which might have even been on his property. And so you get this sense that maybe Potiphar hasn't bought this whole story that his wife has shown him. We continue reading, but while Joseph was in the prison, the Lord was with him and he showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the prison warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison. And he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in everything he did. Can you imagine a prison warden putting a prisoner in charge of everything and not really paying attention to it? But that's what happened here with Joseph. Regardless of how uncontrolled Joseph's life seems to be and how random these events are, God is weaving all of these details and all of these things together to accomplish his purpose. And it doesn't matter what's happening to Joseph because God is reigning on his throne. He's in control. And as we move to the rest of the story and we look at the remaining chapters, we see how God is making all of these things unfold just perfectly as he wants in Genesis 40, we see that God, or Joseph is introduced to Pharaoh's chief cupbearer and uh, his baker. And Joseph accurately interprets a couple of dreams that these guys have. And then he moves into, or we move into chapter 41, and we see that Pharaoh has this incredible nightmare about a severe famine coming on the land. But nobody knows this because nobody can interpret their dream. And so a a prisoner, a slave, Joseph, is brought out of prison to interpret this dream because of the relationship he had formed with either the cupbearer or the baker. And he's now a slave before Pharaoh, and he accurately interprets the dream, not because he's so great, but because God is with him and he's showing him what's going on. And because he accurately interprets the dream, Pharaoh puts Joseph in charge of everything in Egypt. Joseph is now number two, from slave to number two. In in all of Egypt, he is only second to Pharaoh in command. 
And what God does in that chapter as well is he blesses the nation of Egypt. And they, uh, they are blessed so much over the next seven years that they can't even measure all the grain that they take in in the harvest because it is beyond measure. And then in uh, chapters 42 through 44, Joseph's family living in the land of Canaan, because the famine has now hit, Joseph's family runs out of food and they're forced to go into Egypt to ask for food and buy food. And they meet Joseph, but they don't know it's Joseph because Joseph's looking like an Egyptian now. And who would have predicted that a slave could have turned into second in command in Egypt? And so they meet Joseph and they purchase grain for him, but they don't know it's him. In chapter 45, Joseph reveals his identity to them and they carry this good news back to their father. The brothers carry this news back to the father. And in verse, or chapter 46, Joseph's entire family moves from Canaan to Egypt and is given the best of the land of Egypt to settle in. And God flourishes and, 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 and grows that family and blesses all of them because of Joseph for the survival of Israel and for the survival of Egypt. God has allowed all of these events to take place. But the story of Joseph is not part of this isolated plan that's just God's sovereign plan for Joseph's life or for Israel and Egypt. This story of Joseph is actually part of a much larger story of God's sovereign plan, which includes you and it includes me. And the story goes something like this. God wanted to reveal himself to people, to man, humankind, and he wanted them to know him. And so he selected a group of people to do that through. And through that group of people, he took one of them, knowing a famine was coming on the land, and he put them in Egypt in order to raise them to a position of power where they could welcome this group of people in. And when he had welcomed them in, it was only about 70 people in all. But 400 years later, God had taken this group of people and he turned them into a great nation in the land of Egypt. Over a million people, maybe far more than a million people. And at this point, God wanted to take his people and he wanted to give them a land of their own. A land that had been, pre been prepared for them, where cities had already been built. And as he brings them out of Egypt, he gives them laws and rules that they're supposed to live by so that everybody who looks in on them knows that there's something different about them. That these people, the Israelite people, were different because they had the one true God that they knew and they served. And then eventually he gave them their own land. And when he gave them their own land, eventually from that nation that grew up, he would enter into God himself, into the human condition as Jesus Christ, and he would pay for the sins of the world on the cross. And he did that so that not only the Israelite people would know God now, but now everybody who called upon the name of the Lord would know God and would have the Holy Spirit and know him personally in their lives. And now all of us, anyone who professes faith in Christ, is now God's uh, uh, person in the world. People can see God through you and through me as we live life. And this is a part of God's great story for you and me. If God is not sovereign and control, this story that spans all of history is this one amazingly, perfectly orchestrated coincidence. Just change any detail in just the story of Joseph and imagine how differently things had could have turned out. If Joseph hadn't been his father's favorite, and maybe hadn't have been given that coat, his brothers would, wouldn't have been mad with him. If he had have been ugly, maybe he wouldn't have attracted the, the attention of Potiphar's wife. Just any little detail changes, and it changes the whole story, including me and you. The truth is, it's not a coincidence. God is sovereign and he's in control in the chaos and the valleys of life, continuing to work things out for his eternal purposes. I'm a bit of a newsaholic. I'm going to try to wrap up quickly here. I'm a bit of a newsaholic. So I'm watching the news all the time because I'm fascinated about what's happening in the news and how it affects me and looking at God's greater plan in life and how it affects us. And one of the things that I've noticed, one of the topics that they talk about lately a lot is this idea of climate change. And this topic, they talk about it a lot, and it, it, it sort of irritates me to some degree. And I'll tell you why. Because when they report the news, they report it from a perspective that doesn't consider God at all. 
And so when they talk about climate change, our leaders and our, and our, our, our news anchors, they talk about it from this position of fear and dread, like what is happening in the world? And as they try to solve this problem, they do it from a position that doesn't consider God at all. Like somehow we're going to solve this, you know, like humans are on the top of the pile, right? We need to fix this problem. But the truth is, how could we even consider to fix a problem with our planet without considering the one who made it? Folks, if God wants us to be here tomorrow, we're going to be here tomorrow. It doesn't mean we don't steward the earth. It doesn't mean we don't tear, take care of it. I mean, this is God's creation. Of course we're going to take care of it. But to think that we can change anything without considering God, it irritates me that we talk like that. It's futile. God is in control. The last thing I want to say is this. Joseph's view of God's sovereignty, of the sovereignty of God in his life helped him endure some incredibly difficult years. You know, he overcame incredible diversity. His moral compass in that wasn't thrown off. He was able to rule diligently and he was able to forgive people who had done incredibly horrible things to him. None of this would have been possible if Joseph didn't have a proper view of God's sovereignty in his life. Listen to Joseph's words in Genesis 50 verse 20. As he's talking to his brothers, he says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Joseph knew he was a part of something much bigger and it gave him what he needed to endure and even thrive in the valleys and the hard, difficult moments of his life. There's something profound about us acknowledging the sovereignty of God in our lives, to be able to stand in a place and say, I don't know what you're doing, God, but I trust that you're in control. You are God even when I don't know what tomorrow brings and you are God even when I don't understand what's going on. Joseph was a slave and he suffered in Egypt for 13 years. Was God still sovereign during his suffering? Of course he was. And he's still sovereign today in our lives, regardless of what's going on. I wanted to share this with you today because I feel like God's been impressing upon my heart lady lately about how we need to have a proper perspective and theology on him. Because when our theology and our understanding of who God is isn't quite right, we might have a tendency to insert what we think we know about God rather than going to the scriptures and in the Bible and finding out who he is. Sometimes our emotions get in the way of that. So I'm gonna leave that with you now and God's gonna do whatever he wants to do with his Holy Spirit at the proper time with the truth of the sovereignty of God. Let's pray. Lord God, we confess here as a group of people here this morning that you are sovereign over all. You rule, you are in charge and we thank you and we bless you, Lord, that uh, no matter what, there isn't a moment in our lives, there isn't a hair on our head that is outside of your thought and your control. What a wonderful thing. God, in the moments of despair in our lives and the hardships and the, the turmoil, I pray that you would um, be near us, that we would not, that you would cement this truth, this doctrine of your sovereignty in our minds so that we would not be shaken in the hard moments in life and that we would be able to endure and we would be able to survive and thrive as Joseph once did. And we leave this with you. Holy Spirit be upon us in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Thank you, Joel. So I have a question. How then shall we live in light of the truths that we have heard brought forth today? Let's stand and sing this closing hymn. <clears throat> <clears throat> I then shall live as one who's been forgiven. I'll walk with joy to know my debts are paid. I know.
Father, may we live according to the words that we have just sung together and to that which we have heard from your word to us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you as you go. Thank you.